Good evening, everyone, and thanks again for joining us for this Friday's edition of Alaska Weather on this 10th day of May 2019. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Uh, first, uh, has this weather graphic, and uh, you can barely see it there, but high wind warning out for uh, the Anchorage area, Anchorage Bowl and the Turnagain Arm hillside areas uh, until uh, 10 p.m. this evening. Low pressure pulling northwestward out here uh, could continue to gust the winds, uh, could actually increase again here this evening with uh, gusts anywhere from 50 miles an hour, uh, say in East Anchorage to as high as maybe 80 miles an hour, Turnagain Arm and the higher elevations of the Chugach Mountains. And then also up here there's a uh, wind advisory out for the entire Alaska range uh, tonight into tomorrow for winds gusting south, southeast, 60 miles per hour and uh, the red zone there is for uh, extreme fire danger in these areas. So there's a warning for extreme fire danger here on the central eastern Alaska range, especially on the uh, north side of the range there. Very dry conditions and along with the gusty winds. And there are a couple of fires, or at least one, currently burning up in that area. And moving on to the breakup map, we can see uh, pretty well open here, of course, in the Tanana until you get down a little farther on there, and Yukon now open through here with uh, well, Eagle and beyond, and then some open on up to the, uh, uh, where it hits the Porcupine River. Otherwise, the uh, general Yukon here just continuing to do a slow dissolve over the next uh, several days, so not looking for any uh, flooding, no warnings or advisories inside or watches or anything like that. And from there, uh, fire danger, and this is uh, for today, and with winds gusting uh, as high as uh, 50 miles an hour at uh, Delta Junction on the uh, lee side of the mountains there, temperatures approaching 70 degrees up in the central Tanana Valley with uh, 68 at Isleson this afternoon, and uh, mid to upper 60s there in the Fairbanks area. So very dry conditions there with those winds, low humidities down in the uh, lower 20s, lower 20% 20 range. So there's a narrow, that band of extreme fire danger tonight, probably continue into tomorrow as well. And then the winds will gradually die down, uh, may go down to high, but uh, kind of an expanded area of the high fire danger here through the uh, uh, 40 mile country, upper Tanana Valley, right in over toward Tanana, upper Yukon Valley there either side of the river and uh, near the Porcupine River there. And then some areas of that all the way down into the Seward Peninsula there uh, near White Mountain and also here along the west side of the western Alaska range, got some areas of high fire danger as well. And from there, let's move on to the uh, storm total precip, uh, looking for some pretty significant rainfall to occur here. This is uh, until by 4 a.m. tomorrow morning from 4 a.m. Friday to 4 a.m. Saturday. You can see Seward uh, may pick up uh, over three and a half inches of precipitation and up around uh, Portage and the uh, uh, Portage and Portage Glacier and Whittier area, you can see about an inch and a half or an inch of six tenths during that time period. So pretty significant, but uh, right now it doesn't look like there'll be any flooding problems at all, even around the Seward area. And from there, we'll go on to uh, satellite imagery, and you can see uh, pretty clearly here this low pressure center tracking uh, almost right across the Barren Islands, Fognac Island in toward Kamishak Bay, and in a, uh, two hours from now it will have been up into the uh, southwest interior and weakening. And the front, uh, having pushed northward here, uh, not a lot of precipitation with it, except for along the North Gulf Coast, as I mentioned, but up to the north, uh, not much at all. Although this band right here did trigger some thunderstorms this afternoon over the northern Susitna Valley, extended back down uh, and actually to just uh, south of Sparavon. Lightning strikes detected. This portion of the front really washing out as it pushes into the southeast coast. Some light rain, mainly from Sitka, up uh, maybe into the central areas, mostly west of Lynn Canal, and just a few hundredths of an inch at that. Dry down to the south, uh, 
hazy sunshine. That's mostly mid and high level clouds. There's high clouds down here to the south. And uh, you can really see the uh, notching of the clouds here as the winds, southerly winds, blow across the coast range into the Copper River Basin, clearing out there. Winds gusting uh, 40 miles an hour at Golcana. Same thing as Sitna Valley Palmer, I guess, 45 miles an hour. And I believe 53 mile an hour gusts at Delta Junction there. And that's uh, warming it up in the Tanana Valley. And just clouds back here to the northwest and then cooler with the northerly flow back down with this trough. Uh, kind of an area of rain from Nunavak Island there to very close to the Perbolos today. Uh, we had some heavier rain earlier today at St. George associated with this system that's uh, heading down toward the eastern Aleutians and rain throughout the day at light rain over at uh, the Adak Atka area and just isolated showers uh, Dutch Harbor as well as the Alaska Peninsula areas. Dense fog there at uh, uh, both Tin City and actually Cape Lisburn as well was down to uh, zero visibility this afternoon, dense fog. So pretty foggy conditions there. Wind's not all that strong. I think Tin City, I guess, to maybe 25, 30 miles an hour, but lighter at St. Lawrence Island. No precipitation, no fog, but definitely IFR conditions with ceilings at about 300 overcast. And then some areas of fog and flurries along the, uh, anywhere from Wainwright all the way over to Kaktovik, uh, hit and miss there along the eastern Arctic coast. And isolated showers right through here, but the thunderstorms actually just behind the front or associated with it as it pushed northward here. Again, from actually a strike just south of Sparavon and a few up uh, along and on the west side of the mountains and the south side there. Otherwise, generally dry, just isolated showers trying to form in the upslope areas of the eastern Alaska range, but nothing getting over the mountains there at all, kind of hanging up here back along the North Gulf Coast. And for tonight, uh, It'll stay wet for that area from uh, roughly Girdwood westward to Cordova. Uh, showers, uh, maybe some showers there for Yakutat Light. Winds will begin to diminish and uh, another trough though coming up keeps it uh, just unsettled damp, but the winds won't be as strong. Look for diminishing precipitation amounts and winds here with us uh, in this area throughout the night tonight. The low continuing to pull to the northwest, slowly weakening. 994 millibars now and uh, periods of rain along this trough axis across Cuscoan Bay down to the Perbolofs. Showers for the eastern Aleutians and just kind of a low cloud, light wind, fog, drizzle uh, condition out there over the western Aleutian areas. Some flurries, maybe west central Arctic coast, otherwise dry, kind of an offshore flow going on there. Precipitation uh, with that front will be light as it reaches the Brooks Range, but the uh, upslope mountain conditions will enhance it. And that'll spill on over to the eastern north slope, but probably won't reach the eastern Arctic coast. Showers isolated, really isolated and light there across the southeast coast. We'll look for mostly cloudy skies. And moving on to the forecast for tomorrow. Look for a partly to mostly sunny day, or at least into the afternoon here for the southern panhandle. And still uh, kind of a disturbance cutting across the northern areas there. So briefly, maybe tomorrow afternoon, you see a little bit of an enhancement of the showers, and it'll drop off again. Uh, late tomorrow afternoon and into the evening, but it'll keep it kind of cloudy and unsettled there. And same thing for the North Gulf Coast, a little more widespread. Uh, look for rain, light rain, lighter than today here. Uh, but continuing into the afternoon there, say from Prince William Sound over to about Cordova, maybe Yakutat, but winds coming down, conditions improving in the afternoon. Showers here, still a chance of thunderstorms up over the central interior. Uh, pretty isolated though, nothing widespread. Scattered showers suddenly flow here in advance of this trough along the west coast. Extends from Bristol Bay up in toward uh, maybe Galena, possibly Tanana. Otherwise, eastern Tanana Valley uh, on up will be dry tomorrow with variable sunshine. And uh, remnants of that front, maybe a little bit of flurry conditions again for the uh, Arctic coast. Back down into uh, possible rain for Selawick and Kotzebue. And moving ahead to Sunday. High pressure builds in here over the uh, North Gulf Coast areas, but southeast flow with another system, or actually this low developing, tracking eastward, this one kicking off, enough flow comes up with that or moisture in the flow, brings a chance of rain, mostly southern coast of the Kenai Peninsula, maybe western Prince William Sound, still some showers along the Alaska Range, sunny conditions, Tanah Valley through the eastern Copper River Basin, look for a sunny day, lots of sunshine for the Panhandle on Sunday, chance of snow western Arctic coast, and uh, really not much going on, just high pressure and a non-event uh, type of weekend, light winds and lots of cloud, low clouds, fog and drizzle. And for the lows tonight, uh, upper teens to lower 20s there for the Arctic coast, 20s north slope, and then mid-30s once you get south of the Brooks Range here, uh, 
upper 30s near 40 in the Tanaw Valley, lower 40s back into the southwest, but falling back toward freezing toward uh, Macoriac. Lower 40s for the lows here, south central Alaska, lower to mid 40s for the Panhandle. Highs tomorrow in the 50s for the southeast coast. Uh, cooler here over the central interior. What you saw today, probably upper 50s, maybe some lower 60s. 55 to 60 Copper River Basin, 50 south central Alaska, upper 20s along the Arctic coast. And for the lows, uh, lower 20s up there for Sunday morning, mid 30s in the central interior and upper 30s down to the uh, around Kodiak. And then the highs, uh, 55 to 60 in the central interior, 50s in the pan and a lower 50s southeast coast near freezing on the Arctic coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving on to our first flying weather graphic. A lot of IFR here from the Permalofts up to St. Lawrence Island through the strait and then big area of expansive area there, Brooks Range in the Arctic coast and everything in between. Uh, right down along the southwest coast and inland here over the Yukon Cusquam Delta across northern Bristol Bay and then northeastward here, western Cook Inlet to the eastern slopes of the western Alaska Range, north Gulf Coast and a little bit along the border of the Panhandle there, otherwise marginal VFR. And for the afternoon, uh, pretty good VFR here due to the downsloping off the Alaska Range. So uh, still risk of a thunderstorm though over the central Tana Valley and uh, Marginal VFR now over the northern Panhandle, VFR down to the south, and mostly marginal in the afternoon. Some improvement here across south central Alaska and even Prince William Sound, possibly going marginal in the afternoon. And IFR here now just east of the Pribilofs, right up to uh, east of St. Lawrence Island, and the central Arctic coast and north slope, uh, IFR. For the Sunday morning outlook, uh, a little more widespread IFR up there north of the Brooks Range and also along the southern slopes now, band of moisture lifting northward there, but staying VFR here uh, through the central eastern interior 40 mile country, but south of the mountains, uh, look for areas of marginal VFR, pretty widespread starting the day out here right down into the Gulf of Alaska. VFR though along the southeast coast, most of it except the north coast and some IFR back out to near or just east of the Pribilofs, otherwise marginal. And for the afternoon on Sunday, uh, VFR kind of spreads down the river valleys here, almost into the deltas, but uh, most of the, uh, well, all of the Yukon Delta and southwest coast marginal VFR. Eastward there, Kodiak Island, just a patch of IFR left there on the south coast of the Kenai Peninsula, uh, Prince William Sound marginal, south central Alaska marginal, and the Panhandle looking really good, VFR right up into the eastern Copper River Basin. And four passes. Anatuvik, uh, IFR to start, gradually improving to marginal VFR, and same trend for Adigan, IFR becoming marginal. Lake Clark and Merrill, IFR in the morning, gradually becoming marginal VFR throughout the afternoon. And rainy, same uh, trend, IFR to marginal. And windy, marginal VFR here through the pass and south entrance will be the lowest conditions. Uh, but even that will be probably be marginal VFR in the north entrance. And that same pattern for Isabel, marginal VFR through the pass, but north side there coming out the entrance, VFR. Mintasta, generally VFR, any marginal conditions would be on that southern approach. And for Tanita, VFR, possible marginal VFR here for the eastern side. And Portage, IFR becoming marginal slowly by late afternoon. And for Chilkoot and White, marginal VFR. Freezing levels, uh, kind of a cooler pocket coming in, kind of wrapping back around here as that low lifts northward. So 2,000 feet right up the Alaska Range in across Copper River Basin there to the northern Panhandle. And then a pretty uh, tight gradient here over the southern southeast coast and about 4,000 feet up over the interior. 2,000 feet or less, or uh, 1 to 2,000 here out over the Bering Sea. And for icing, kind of a swath of uh, light to isolated, moderate or mixed rime icing here from actually the north slope across the western interior, mostly the uh, Yukon Delta there, down into the eastern Aleutians. Heavier icing here would be along the North Gulf Coast and maybe even the uh, Alaska, western Alaska Range here. Could be some considerable moderate with that, and that will be kind of shifting up to the north and slowly diminishing throughout the day. Jet stream. Upper level low here over the southeast Bering Sea. So southwest flow, kind of a trough here lifting through. So that's uh, 
perfect for continued wet conditions in across the northern panhandle, unsettled uh, mostly from the in interior there. And for the 9,000 foot wind, southwest 20 to 30, maybe even up to 35 knots here over the southwest interior, but 30 knot winds to 35 knot winds all the way down to the Alaska Peninsula. And taking a look at uh, 3,000 feet, we've got uh, about the same pattern here, a couple of low centers, lighter winds along that trough axis, and then south 25 to 30 knots here, uh, up into the interior, central interior, then diminishing up to the northeast there. Westerly is about 20 to 25 into the panhandle, and 20 to 30, or 10 to 20 knot winds, not too bad out there for the Aleutians. That's about it, 20 to 25, even to the Fox Islands, per bluffs around 25. And for turbulence, uh, widespread moderate chop here along and lee side of the Alaska Range, back down into much of the southwest interior, northeast Bristol Bay, and Kodiak Island. And after the break, I'll be back with a look at the sea ice conditions and the marine forecasts. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens uh, from the GINA, or Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thanks for joining us again, Eric. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, we are talking about satellites today and uh, what, what are satellites? And the easy way to talk about that would be to uh, introduce our friend the globe here, which is a round uh, spheroid type shape. We haven't been on a flat earth uh, as far as uh, history is known for uh, several hundred years now. And because of that, we, we also know that we are orbiting around other objects in space and that objects are orbiting mm -hmm. around the earth as well. We call all those things satellites in some form or fashion, right Eric? Right, well this leads to the discussion of Johannes Kepler's oh, yeah. research 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work and founded the three laws of planetary motion, which okay. are important to planets mm -hmm. and also to weather satellites. Okay. Kepler's first law talks about how uh, the orbit of an object around another object is mm -hmm. uh, an ellipse, not necessarily a circle. It's kind of a flattened circle? Yeah, okay. depending on how I mean, flat it could be. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say they're mostly circular. Okay. The second law is most important for us, though, yeah. and that is the closer an object is to the thing it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. So in the solar system, the planet Mercury is mm -hmm. the closest planet to the sun. It orbits the sun in 88 days. It moves at 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's a it lot is different just than Earth. moving. Okay. Right. And um, further out from the Earth is Jupiter, mm -hmm. and it moves at only one quarter the speed of Mercury, and it has to uh, go further. So it takes 12 of our years for Jupiter to make one lap. Hmm. Okay. The further out you are, the slower you go. Okay. So we're talking about planets. Why? What does it have to do with weather satellites? Turns out, Kepler's laws apply to planets orbiting the sun. They also apply to satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay. You know, our natural satellite is the moon. There's right. the famous Apollo 8 Earthrise shot. Beautiful shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you could just talk about that forever. <laughs> uh, December 1968, uh -huh. the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Okay. It takes a month to go around mm -hmm. the Earth. It's that far out, it takes a full month to do an orbit. Another shot here of the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Instead of being 250,000 miles out, the ISS is only 250 miles out. It's really close. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't take a full month for the space station to go around the Earth. It only takes right. 90 minutes. Uh -huh. It's so close, it just whips right around 90 minutes. Okay. So weather satellites, there are a number of weather satellites and there are a number of orbits. The further out you have the satellite, the mm -hmm. longer it takes to go around the Earth. And this is important because different satellites have different purposes. So we have a satellite here. This little okay. salt shaker lid will serve as our satellite going around the Earth. Let's say you have a satellite that's 22,000 miles above the Earth. Uh -huh. This is kind of a magical spot because at that distance, it takes a full day for the satellite to go around the Earth. Oh, Imagine okay. if you put your satellite 22,000 miles up from the equator uh -huh. and had it go with the Earth as the Earth spun. At the same speed. Right. Okay. The satellite goes around the Earth just as fast as the Earth itself is turning in effect. The satellite will hover in one spot, oh, I see. and it, it appears when you make a movie loop of picture after mm -hmm. picture after picture, you can replay that and you get these movie loops. Geostationary satellites, these okay. are called, because uh -huh. they're stationary in appearance, and uh, they provide a constant frame of reference. We've got an example here. Another nice thing about these satellites, since they're that far out mm -hmm. at 22,000 miles, you can see from pole to pole, which is nice. So they're, they're pretty broad view and a constant frame of reference. So th those are the pictures, that if you're watching a weather satellite loop on TV, your favorite weather mm -hmm. show, that's the picture that you're going to see is you one that's bet. sitting over the same spot. If you're seeing a, a movie loop play uh -huh. again and again, that came from geostationary satellites. Okay. That's the only way you can do that. Yeah. The bummer, though, 
For us in Alaska, is yeah. we're up on the very top of the planet, and mm -hmm. for, for geostationary satellites to work, they have to be over the equator. So for the geostationary bird to view Alaska, it's kind of like reading a book, but you're reading it edge on oh, like that. Right. So there's another kind of orbit called the polar orbit, okay. which is nice. We're near the pole. Yeah. And here's a satellite. Those polar orbiters are much closer to the Earth. Mm -hmm getting down toward International Space Station elevation, and they're not in the equatorial plane, rather their orbital plane is inclined okay. like this. And the Earth turns under that satellite as the satellite orbits. Hmm. The nice thing about that is for Alaska, the satellite will go right over Alaska a few times a day. And so you get a much closer image. We've got a, a shot from the uh, Sumi NPP satellite. Uh -huh. Uh, specifically, it's a true color image from the VIRS sensor, that's an acronym there, okay. but it's a beautiful shot of Alaska and you can see so much detail, the kind of detail because you're close in. Very high resolution. You couldn't yeah. get this kind of view from geostationary satellites. Okay. The, the advantage of these polar orbiters is nice close imagery, you can mm -hmm. see a lot of detail. The disadvantage though is that the satellite flies by right. and then you have to wait a while to get the next image. And it, if geostationary weaknesses are that you're reading the page like that, mm -hmm. the polar orbiter, you're reading the page straight on, but it's, it's so close, <laughs> and then right. it zips by, okay. and you have to wait for the satellite to come around the Earth again. So there's no one perfect solution. Okay. Different satellites for different orbits, uh, each has their strength, and amazingly, it all comes back to Johannes Kepler and his laws of planetary motion, the same laws that govern how the planets orbit the sun, they govern how the satellites orbit the Earth, and even our little pretend salt shaker right, right here. Right, okay. Well, since, uh, what, the 1957 Sputnik, we've been uh, putting man-made objects into uh, orbit around the Earth and starting to get pictures back. Who knows what mm -hmm. will happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Oh, Amazing it's, it's stuff. It's a growing science, and uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And uh, for more information on GINA, and uh, what the satellite uh, systems do there and uh, what Eric's been talking about today, you can go to the web address on your screen. For Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. to sea ice analysis uh, continuing to show slowly thinning out and melting away here. Uh, slowly, even though the winds are a little bit out of the north and are forecast to be, it's still going to kind of uh, progressively slowly melt and uh, retreat over the next five to six days. So going on to the uh, coastal water forecast here for the southeast coast, not bad tomorrow, northwest 15 on the south coast, west 10 to 15 north side here, seas anywhere from 8 to 11 feet. Small crowd advisories, Lynn Canal, south winds 25, five foot seas. And uh, anywhere from west to northwest, 15 knots, central and southern inside waters with seas at three feet. And then for uh, Clarence Strait on Sunday, north at 20, northwest 15 for Stevens Passage and even lighter winds out of the northwest Berlin Canal. Here along the coast, most of the coastline uh, north at 20 with seven foot seas, a little lighter up there to the north, 15 knot winds. And for Prince William Sound tomorrow, south winds 20 knots, seas three feet, southerlies at 20 for the eastern North Gulf Coast turning southwest here back to the west and then up to small craft advisory southwest 25 for the Barren Islands 10 foot seas south 20 Kamishak Bay but Cook Inlet south winds 25 knots uh, of course that means small craft advisories and then for Sunday those uh, come down especially northern Cook Inlet down to 10 knots out of the east east 20 here south of the forelands Good small craft advisories, Kamishak Bay East winds 30 knots, southeast 30 for the Barrens, southeast 15 to 20 for the North Gulf Coast and Prince William Sound, southeast at 10. Kodiak Island tomorrow, southwest 20 knots. And from Sitkanak to Castle Cape, small craft advisories for southwesterlies at 25, 10 foot seas. Small crafts also out for Bristol Bay, south 25 knots there, the Alaska Peninsula southerlies at 20. And for the day on Sunday, west winds 25 knots, south side of the peninsula there for uh, small craft advisories. It'll extend all the way up to uh, Sitkanak, where it'll turn more southerly here in this zone. Southeast 30 there on the east side of Kodiak and east 25 for Shelikoff Strait. East 20 knots for Bristol Bay with four foot seas. And for the Fox Islands tomorrow, uh, west northwest, 20 to 25 knots about does it there with seven to eight foot seas. Lighter ones, Adak and Atka. Northwest 15 to 20, and then 15 knot winds from uh, ADAC actually all the way out to Shimianat 2, turning northwest to north. For Sunday, even lighter winds in store for uh, these areas. Northwest 10 knots from Shimia all the way over to uh, 
ADAC, and they stay northwest here, picking up about 20 knots in toward Nikolsky and Umak Island, then Unalaska Island, small craft advisories northwest at 25, seas 9 feet. Southwest coast, south of Nunavak Island, we've got southwest winds at 25, blowing into Cuscoan Bay, north side there. Small craft advisories north 25, and 30 knot winds right up across St. Lawrence Island, the Bering Strait, 15 knots north and sound. Small craft advisories for northwest 25 for St. Paul and uh, St. George, north 25, St. Matthew Island. And for uh, Sunday, lighter winds, kind of lighter, more variable, call it... Uh, Variable 15 or less here along the southwest coast, mostly east though, south of Nunavak Island, five foot seas. Small craft advisories continue for the Pervolos through Sunday, north 25 knots, and then back down to 15 there for St. Matthew Island. Same thing for St. Lawrence Island, Norton Sound though, south at 20. Up along the uh, eastern Beaufort Sea coast, uh, actually the central coast here, lightest winds for tomorrow, northeast at 20 with brisk wind advisories here on the east side. For east northeasterlies at 25 knots and northeast 25 here pick up to about 30 knots Cape Beaufort to Cape Thompson and then back down to 25 knots Cape Thompson to Wales out of the north there with uh, roughly five foot seas. And then for Sunday lose the brisk wind advisories here on the east side winds really coming down kind of a southerly drift there south to southeast 10 to 15 northeast 15 on the central coast a uh, tad higher here on the west side 20 knots it'll extend all the way down to Cape Thompson north 20 Cape Thompson to Wales. And for tonight again, that low as it tracks northwestward here, gets to about 60 north, uh, winds could uh, kick back up, could see gusts anywhere from 50 to 80 miles an hour, depending on uh, your location and elevation, mostly elevation here. The 80 mile an hour gusts, of course, uh, turning an arm, higher elevations, Chugach Mountains, maybe the Anchorage Hillside. Otherwise, rain diminishing, winds diminishing for the North Gulf Coast, low by uh, 4 a.m. tomorrow, right about in this position. So uh, that may bring a chance of rain into the Cuscombe Valley. And this front pushes northward and brings a chance of moisture into the Brooks Range, spilling into the eastern north slope. And some uh, unsettled conditions, a couple of troughs out over the southeast Bering and the Aleutians Alaska Peninsula. And for tomorrow, a uh, very weak disturbance cuts eastward across the northern Panhandle, otherwise mostly sunny on Sunday and more rain coming into Kodiak Island in the afternoon. <laughs> These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.